loud round of applause. And welcome to the stage, James Halliday, as we know him, Substack. Hello, everyone. How's the audio? Is it good? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to just kind of have a bunch of wacky demos and fun things about the disintermediated web, which is just a fancy word for building peer-to-peer -peer systems that nobody owns, that nobody runs, that just are. Because I really hate administering servers and dealing with all of that complexity. And now, finally, we can put everything in a browser. So that, I think we're kind of on the tail end of the second wave of dumb terminals. Like, we have all of these supercomputers in our pocket or on our lap, but pretty much they're just an interface to some corporate data center somewhere. Somewhere very far away, unfortunately, and if you have a bad Wi-Fi connection, if you have bad internet connection, which is often if you travel and if you're not just in an in a air-conditioned office in Mountain View, then you're going to have problems with the network. And so I think that all of these new browser features, especially WebRTC and IndexedDB, let us get away from that model into a new, exciting, crazy realm where you can do anything you can think of, and you can have infinite capacity. Uh, you have as much capacity as all of the people using your system, not just what you can personally provision. So you can do things basically for free. Um, that's really important, I think, for the future of open source as well, because we can build models that only need to sustain people working on those systems and creating content, not, not funding this gigantic apparatus that is like a commercial data center. Here's some other bad things about uh, centrally controlled systems. I'm sure that a lot of people have many gripes. Uh, there's a lot of weird censorship angles, and like if you have to de depend on a platform to police content, that's not really a very nice relationship. Like uh, videos get pulled from YouTube all the time. There's a really great community on SoundCloud. Uh, it's this community of jokes that is fantastic. Um, people make all of this really excellent joke content. But unfortunately, copyright bots come in and do, do the sweeps now and then, and it's really been very bad for their community. So how can we build a system that doesn't have those problems, that has entirely new problems? Uh, here's some other bad things about um, the current state of the web, like, like signal requires a mobile phone number wrong, um, real name policies are terrible, and platforms can just switch off a, a system whenever they feel like it. Like uh, Twitter clients, for a while there was a lot of diversity, but then Twitter was just like, no, we're not going to allow this on our system. We need to make money. So how do you make systems that no one can own, that pretty much nobody can make money from? You know, Maybe there, there's room in there, but I don't really care. So uh, the fun thing is that data centers are already distributed systems, more or less. Uh, a lot of architectures that work in these corporate data centers, you can also just put them directly on the client. And now that we have all of these features in the browser, that is a very, um, it's a thing that I think makes a lot of sense. So then you can finally cut out these middlemen who broker every transaction, which is the servers and the mediators. So uh, I think the best way to approach this field is to have a good problem, like have a problem that's not being solved very well or at all by centralized providers. Like here are a few. Uh, I think if you want to do anything in offline remote communities, it's peer-to-peer -peer systems work fantastically well compared to everything else, which doesn't work at all. Um, also, if you have really large data sets that you just need to transfer between computers across the internet, peer-to-peer -peer systems are fantastic. The DAT project is doing a lot of great work. I'm using a lot of their modules for my experiments. Uh, also, live streaming, I think, could really, like if you use WebRTC to connect peers directly, not just uh, the standard Hello World app where you're just connecting to one peer, but you can use peer-to-peer -peer protocols inspired by BitTorrent. Um, there's one, this package Hypercore that's part of DAT that I have a demo of almost working to build a completely peer-to-peer, -peer, infinitely scaling live streaming system. So hopefully we'll get to that. So. Uh, a word of caution about peer-to-peer -peer systems. I think that a lot of people try to build things in the old mindsets too often. I see 
a lot of this with anyone doing anything to do with blockchains. I think it's a lot simpler if you just don't have some of these problems in the first place. Like you, you reorient your worldview and your problems and what you're being required to do such that you just don't have these problems. And you can have different problems instead that are actually much easier to solve. Uh, especially consensus is a big one. So, for example, if you need to build a replacement for DNS, you need to build a naming system. Well, that's a really hard problem because it requires that everyone should agree. And if you've ever tried to build a system in the real world with people where everyone has to agree, I've had to do this a little bit, then it's very hard. <laughs> it's a very political, fraught system. So if you just don't have that problem in the first place, like if you use uh, cryptographic keys for your naming system instead, which has other problems, like discoverability, but you can solve them other ways, then your life will be much easier and you can get things actually done and you won't fight as many political battles like is happening in Bitcoin land right now. So uh, I think that the best niche for a lot of this new technology is going to be in places, yeah, I've mentioned some of these. Um, the best part though is that it's not just infinite scaling, it's actually inverse scaling. So the more people use your peer-to-peer -peer system, like the more seeds there are in a torrent, for example, the better the system works for everyone. So you get network effects that provide capacity. You don't get network effects that cost you exponentially more money uh, to operate a service. But the, the trade-off there is that you have to do everything in the client because there are only clients. So that is the only place where anything can be done. And I think that takes a bit of a mind change if you're used to, if you remember, you know, web pages that have some client validation, you're like, oh, that's a silly joke. Well, actually, in distributed systems, that is literally all that you can do. So it just takes some getting used to, I think. Uh, here's an example. So there's this great package called Chloride, um, which is based on sodium, and there's a lot of stuff, but the main thing is uh, NACL keys, or sometimes called sodium keys, are just fantastically simple. The keys are very small. Uh, so they're about 32 bytes for a public key, so it's quite easy to use that as, a, as something you can copy-paste. It's easy to select with your mouse. Uh, here's an example of creating a public key. This will print out the public key and store the result to a JSON file. That's your uh, create account stage. Notice how there's no server network traffic here. That's because it's not necessary. You can just do everything offline in the client. No one else in the world has to know about your private or public key except for you until you decide to give someone else that information. Um, then to sign a message, you can do this, where you call sodium.cryptosigndetached, and you get, why is it called detached? There's, it is. Uh, <laughs> there's another one, cryptosign. Don't use that one, use the detached one. Why, I don't know. Uh, actually, I do know. So <laughs> you give it your message and your private key, and it will generate a signature. Uh, so here, this would print it out in hex. It's a message, hello, London. Then finally, if, if uh, someone else already has your public key, then you can, they can verify your message. So they would write something like this using crypto sign verify detached, which is a mouthful. And then the order of arguments is tricky too, but it's the signature is the first one, the method is the second, or the message is the second, and then you put the public key. And those all have to be formatted just so it's kind of annoying, but it's not that bad. It's pretty short, it fits on some slides. Uh, there we go, There's your, there is a peer-to-peer -peer user system. Um, some other really great techniques for using these kinds of user systems are if your whole user model is not based on like a number that increments, like with Twitter, for example, but instead it's based on either the public key directly. Uh, that's easy if you use ed25519 curves, which are what you get with uh, libsodium, or uh, sometimes, especially in older systems, they might use the hash of a public key. So BitTorrent has this fantastic <laughs> extension called uh, BEP44, BitTorrent Extension Protocol 44, um, that is quite difficult to implement, having implemented it, but it lets you uh, put small mutable payloads on an otherwise completely immutable network, which is the, the BitTorrent DHT. It's meant so that you, know, you put a torrent file and then you can't change your mind later and replace it with something that people didn't intend to download. But with this extension, uh, you still can't change existing torrent files, but you have a very small mutable pointer, so you can build like a linked list structure easily that goes from message to message. So that's one kind of, in architectures, which is a fun word, uh, because 
It's about making systems that nobody runs, nobody owns, they just sort of are, they exist in the ether, and you can depend on them. And actually, they can be quite robust and reliable, especially because there's the only attack surface is everyone's client. So you don't have to worry about a lot of things that you have to worry about with more centralized architectures. You can worry about completely different problems instead. Uh, fun thing, uh, Kappa architecture, and or sometimes called event sourcing, they're pretty similar from what I can tell, are a really useful model for building these kinds of systems. And they're also very common in, in very large data centers, which makes sense because they're both distributed systems. Um, and then DHTs are really useful if you need to transfer, if you need to have um, some kind of key value models where you need to find peers, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'll explain Kappa architecture. It's a very simple idea where instead of, you know, instead of having a big relational database where you, you do update and delete and you query things, instead of that, you have only update, not delete. So you only, or sorry, only, you only insert documents. You don't ever change anything and you don't delete anything. Uh, with that append-only log, you can build indexes called materialized views that, the nice thing is, if you've ever had to do like data migrations in a, in a big annoying database, you can just, with this architecture, you can just delete your indexes. So if you use something like LevelDB, you could stick them in a directory and then just rm-rf that directory, and then the log, or the indexes can just be rebuilt a new way, or maybe the same way, whatever, from, because the log contains all of the data and it's a deterministic uh, way of kind of like, the indexes are only there really to speed up walking every single document in the log, which can be really slow or take a lot of memory. Um, so some really interesting browser primitives and that you can use in Node or the browser, uh, I think that are really important if you want to take some notes, and these will be on, online later. Uh, Hyperlog, I'm going to show a bit. Hypercore is a very new piece of technology made by the DAT project that's fantastic for building uh, peer-to-peer -peer sharing models that you can update, which is fantastic because if you want to build something like a live streaming service, then you need to actually append data to that structure, but you still want the benefits of having your peers share with other peers so that you get this kind of viral propagation of content throughout your network and you don't have to worry about bandwidth bills anymore, except for your home internet connection maybe. Uh, a really useful idea for this kind of stuff too is uh, Gossip Protocol. So the really simple version that is also one of the best versions is a randomized Gossip Protocol. And that's where you just connect to random peers, you share data, and so long as uh, you're not connected to the exact same set of peers, it pretty much works out that you're, you probably won't have a net split in your network, which is an important thing. This is very easy to build with WebRTC Swarm. I've got a demo of that uh, right here. So. Let's suppose we want to build a really simple kind of Twitter-style uh, publish-subscribe system. How do we do that? First, require a bunch of modules. These are, these are good ones. Uh, I wrote a few. Other people wrote some others. They're pretty good. Uh, oh, no. Where did the other things go? Oh, OK. I don't know why that's in there. Um, so next, uh, we need to set up the the swarm logic and the hyperlog. So with hyperlog, you pass it a level DB instance, and you pass in, um, you can use this model, module hyperlog sodium that does all of the annoying lib sodium stuff. Uh, but the nice thing is if you have a key pair, then you can print out that key pair and use that for addressing. So if you want to put your address on the BitTorrent DHT, for example, then you can do that, and then people will be able to have a pointer to the rest of your network. So then you establish the uh, WebRTC swarm by just giving it a signal hub. This is one of the few pieces of server infrastructure that you pretty much need maybe a handful of these to serve the entire internet. Uh, so I don't think it's a, it's not too big of a deal. It's similar in architecture to BitTorrent trackers before <coughs> BitTorrent got the DHT. So it's something that can be improved later, but we don't quite have a 100% uh, serverless to use the common, not the, uh, not the other way of thinking about serverless. Server-free, perhaps. Um, anyways, then you can just populate the log. So here we can read standard in, uh, call log.appends to put messages into our log. That's pretty much all you need to do as a publisher. Um, that can work however you want. And then gossip. So this is literally all that you need to have a gossip protocol. 
uh, you need, if you have a log structure like Hyperlog provides, you can just call replicate, and then you get this duplex stream, you pipe the ends together, and you have a peer-to-peer -peer gossip protocol replication system. That's basically it for the publisher side. And then the subscriber also needs many of the same modules, minus a few. And then you set up the Hyperlog and the Swarm, just like we did with the publisher. And then that's it. So you can tail the log live to get updates. And when you get a peer, you just pipe that into the replication system. And now uh, the nice thing is that the Hyperlog messages are signed. So someone can't just hop on the network and impersonate traffic uh, because the cryptographic signatures won't match. And you'll know that peer is acting, acting wrongly, and you can stop talking to them. Uh, one really nice thing about this architecture is that your friends or your followers or whoever subscribing will actually help to host your data. So it's not just you broadcasting out to every peer. You broadcast to your peers, and then the people, uh, if you're not online, can talk to your peers. And even if you are online, they'll probably also talk to your peers because your bandwidth is limited. OK, so I have a real-world demo that you can check out. It's, on, it's hosted on NeoCities, which is a static HTML hosting site like GeoCities. So this is how you know it's legit, because there's only one server, and it's a signal hub run by Matthias. It does extremely little. And if you go to this URL, uh, then it might connect. It probably won't even connect, but it doesn't matter, because it works fine offline, too. So I can type a message. And even if none of you are getting these messages, even if I have no peers, if eventually I get peers, the logs will concat and the messages will be available. So that is a fun example. Here's a GitHub repo for it. Um, I've also been doing uh, some contract work for this nonprofit NGO, building peer-to-peer -peer databases uh, for maps for remote indigenous communities, mostly in the Amazon. So about four weeks ago, I was in Guyana, the one in South America, uh, not in Africa. It's next to Brazil. And I was working there uh, to kind of help with, this, with these uh, remote mapping projects that, have, that these communities have had for a long time, and just helping them with tech stuff. So uh, this OSM P2P model is a very simple Kappa architecture where there's an append-only log. And I'm running it right here. So there's an append-only log of data. Uh, the updates are written to it. And then those updates feed into a key value store called HyperKV that provides basically the OpenStreetMap data model of nodes, ways, and relations. And then uh, the, the replication model is, if you want to replicate, you click this button, synchronizar, which you can't see. It's all in Spanish. Uh, you select the USB drive on your system, uh, and then you take, you take that USB drive, you go on a boat or a quad bike or a truck to the next village, you put it in their, one of their computers, it, it replicates, but the replication is bidirectional, so then you bring it back and put it in your computer, load it up, and now you've both got the same copy of the data. So this can happen over large distances, large time scales. And the data model is such that you never really get into conflicts. You just could have multiple forks of the data. But the database is completely functional in that state, which I think a lot of databases that are built for enterprise environments don't typically do because they're sort of, they can be a little bit more controlling <laughs> about how their system works. But you can't really do that with people who are completely removed from like, sysadmins and whatever. Uh, so here's another example that I've been working on lately that I mentioned. Uh, it's called Spellcast. And it is a peer-to-peer, -peer infinitely scaling, uh, live webcasting thingy built with uh, WebRTC. Oh, it's not, oh, I think it's because I nudged my laptop screen. And so the camera doesn't work anymore when I do that. OK, well, that one doesn't work, but it will be around pretty soon. I mean, it barely works to begin with, so. <laughs> You, you're not missing anything. OK, so that's all I have. And thanks. Wow, fantastic. Some people